that you love us, that you desire to fellowship with us, God. And we, we pray that you would just pour out your spirit and be glorified in this place. We give you all the honor, the glory, and the praise. Lead us now. Oh, 
pull us apart we are joined as one by your love hope will rise as we become more and conquer us through the one who loved the of God you go before lift me up as I wake eyes of God look upon be my side God is satisfied and sustained as I hear the voice of God lead me on be my guide be my guide Christ be all around me, above and below me, before and behind me, in every eye that sees me, and Christ be all around me. Yeah. As I go, the hand of God. My defense by my side as I rest, breath of God, I fall upon, bring me peace, bring me peace above and below me, before. Christ be all around me, above and below me, before and behind me, in every eye that sees me. Christ be all around me, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. Christ be all around me. Above and below me, 
every eye that sees me and Christ be all around me above and below me before and behind me in every eye that sees me Christ be all around
and you lifted me up, and you lifted me up. Oh, when there was death, you brought life from love. Oh, when there was fear, you brought courage. And when I was afraid, you And you lifted me up, and you lifted me up, where there was death, where there was death, you brought life and Lord, where there was fear, you brought courage, and when I was afraid, you And you lifted me up, and you lifted me up. I was singing where there was death, where there was death, you brought life and love. Where there was fear, you brought courage. And when I was afraid, you And you lifted me up, and you lifted me up, and you lifted me up, and you lifted me up. We sing, God with us, God for us, nothing could come again. No one could stand between us, God with us, God for us, nothing could come against, no one could stand between us. need the power of your spirit tonight as we do every day we pray today here and now Lord in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that you would show yourself mighty to us Lord we acknowledge our weakness we acknowledge Lord that we fail we acknowledge our fear but we thank you that you help us to overcome and that you, you instill in us faith. And we pray, Lord, that we would walk by faith and we would live by faith and we would grow in faith. Lord, we pray that the study tonight would encourage each one of us, Lord, in our understanding of you and, and your love for us, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We love you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Good evening. I almost said good morning, but that would have been, um, that would have been off a little bit. So greet one another, and then you can have a seat. Say hello to somebody. Well, let's turn in our Bibles to the Gospel of Mark. If you need a Bible, please raise your hand. The ushers are bringing one through the aisle. Glad to get one into your hands here. The Gospel according to Mark, we are finishing up in this next two weeks. Tonight we'll finish, we'll get through chapter 15, I, I think, I hope, Lord willing. <laughs> And then next week we finish up in chapter 16. 
And then we have the holidays upon us. And uh, don't be a Grinch. <laughs> um, we will uh, cover some things regarding, well, in, in next week we're going to have, is next week Thanksgiving? Okay, so next week we will not be in Mark chapter 16. We will finish it up after Thanksgiving because next week is the night of thanks where we just gather and we, we give praise and thanks and we'll have a video and testimonies and it's going to be a great time. So that is next Wednesday night. The following Wednesday night we will finish the Gospel of Mark and then we will move into Christmas season and after the first of the year we're going to start an Old Testament book. I think <laughs> we're going to go to Deuteronomy. So if you've always wondered what Deuteronomy is all about, we're going to find out starting in January. All right, so, well, actually, let me rephrase that. We'll go to Deuteronomy after we have our month of prayer in January. We're going to have an entire month that's dedicated to prayer. So our messages will all be on prayer, and we will have extended prayer times on Wednesday night. Even our Sunday morning is going to be geared around prayer. We want to begin 2017 with a whole new vision and attitude on prayer. So looking forward to that. So then in February. So you got plenty of time to read ahead. You can read the whole book of Deuteronomy between now and then. In February, we will start the book of Deuteronomy, Lord willing, if Jesus doesn't come back. And if he does, you're not going to miss Deuteronomy, let me tell you. <laughs> okay. Mark chapter 15. So we have come to the point where Jesus has gone through his first trial. Now you might recall that there were two trials that Jesus went through. One was before the Jews, it was before the chief priests, and it was really a mock trial. It really was not a, even a legal trial. It was held at night, which was never allowed, and it was really a fabricated, all the questions, all the accusations were fabricated, and, you know, Jesus really didn't defend himself to the Jews, so after they questioned him and declared him guilty of blasphemy, they beat him. And you might recall last week we talked about how that beating was so brutal because they put a covering over his head and they, they hit him blindsided and just the brutality that our Lord went through. And then... Um, and really, in a sense, these Jewish leaders, they set themselves up in a place of God. They, their biggest problem was that Jesus Christ was threatening their position. And Jesus is getting in their way. And so they've got to get him out of here. And, and they, they, they want Jesus dead, but they have no way to put him to death. The uh, right of capital punishment was not, in, not allowed in the state of Israel at that point, except through the Romans. So if capital punishment were legal, they would have stoned Jesus, because that was the way, that was the um, biblical way. You know, in the Old Testament, the teachings were to, for stonings, so Jesus would have been stoned. But of course, we know that the Romans ruled in this day, and their way of putting people to death was crucifixion, and we'll see that that this is what it leads up to. So this leads us now to the second trial in front of Pontius Pilate. Now, they have to come up with a different accusation for Jesus other than blasphemy, because blasphemy doesn't mean anything to the Romans. They don't care if Jesus calls himself God or a prophet or a, any of that. That's irrelevant to them. So they will trump up some other uh, accusations toward him. And verse, verse 1 of chapter 15, immediately in the morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council, and they bound Jesus, led him away, and delivered him to Pilate. By the way, they bound him with ropes, but the ropes aren't the thing that held Jesus. 
It was his love for us that held him because he knew he was, he was sent. He was, you know, Luke tells us he set his face like a flint toward Jerusalem, heading toward the cross. And for this purpose was the Son of God manifest. This was the reason he came. He came to die. And so um, he could have broken those, cha- those, those ropes very easily in a second, but he was held by love. And Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? He answered and said, it is as you say. So clearly the accusation that's come is now one of sedition. It is undermining the authority of the Roman Empire as Jesus calls himself the king of the Jews. Now, from a, you know, Pilate really doesn't care if he calls himself the king of the Jews, but if they're accusing him of being the king and usurping the authority of Rome, well, then that's a a capital offense. And that's what they're trying to get Pilate to bring him to. And the chief priest accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. Then Pilate asked him again, saying, do you answer nothing? See how many things they testify against you. But Jesus still answered nothing, so Pilate marveled. Many accusations, but no response. Hoping that one would stick. The idea is they keep throwing these accusations, hoping one will stick, and that the one that Jesus was the king of the Jews is the one, I think, that strikes Pilate and makes it so that there would be a consideration of of usurping the authority of Rome. But isn't it interesting that Jesus did not open his mouth? He didn't respond to the accusations. Isaiah tells us that he wouldn't. It says, though being reviled, he'd open not his mouth to defend himself. By the way, I think this is a really good lesson for us. When you are accused, especially by someone who's really set in their ways and really has determined that you are completely wrong, does it really pay to defend yourself? Like, do you find you, being, you get anything other than frustration out of defending yourself? Pilate marvels that he doesn't do that. It's really fruitless to defend yourself against someone who's already convinced that you are completely wrong. You're not going to change their mind. I've seen this recently, and and I really believe that we're wasting our breath when we do that, that we're, we're really in a bad place. There's not a whole lot of point to it. I, I want to personally be more like our Lord Jesus Christ. When I'm accused, I, I, I'm like, whatever. <laughs> I want to be that way. I'm not always that way. And I'm better when I'm accused. I'm, I'm okay if I get accused. If somebody I know and love gets accused, then I get mad. You know, it, it, you can accuse me. If you say anything about my wife, my family, somebody like that, I, I, I gotta, or my friends, close friend, that, that gets my, my ire up. But Pilate You know, he had quite a volatile relationship with the Jews already. And he's put over, uh, he was put over them to keep peace. Remember, he is the procurator of Judea. He's the governor of Judea. And he's put there to keep the peace. But there was often revolts under Pilate. The history books tell us that sometimes it was because Pilate would actually stir up trouble by going into their temple and even doing things in their temple, and it would anger the Jews. Or, you know, demanding that they not be allowed to worship at their temple at a given time. And he's looking to do something to appease the Jews. Now, he's in a bad position. Because they believe Jesus is guilty. He is taking this guy in. Now, you might remember that his wife had a dream. One of the other Gospels tells us this story. 
that his wife had this dream that he should not have anything to do with that just man. Be wise. Don't do anything. His wife warns him. And so Pilate, I'm sure, is a bit walking on eggshells with this whole situation. And so verse 6 tells us that there's a feast, and we know it was Passover, and at the feast he was accustomed to releasing one prisoner to them, whomever they requested, and there was one named Barabbas, who was chained with fellow fellow rebels. They had committed murder in the rebellion. Then the multitude, crying aloud, began to ask him to do just as he had always done for them. Release one of the prisoners, they were saying. But Pilate answered and said, Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? For he knew the chief priests had handed him over because of envy. So he gets these chief priests. He knows their hearts. He... He's not deceived by these guys. Remember, he had, a, he had regular doings with these chief priests. He was always dealing with these guys. And he knew they were corrupt. He knew they were self-motivated completely. And that there was no, everything they were doing was really just for their own ways. It was for what they wanted. It was, there was no, they had no benevolence toward anyone. And so, there's this guy named Barabbas. And we see that he's described as a guy who was a rebel who committed murder. So we have a murderous rebel, and we have the Son of God. And he figures, well, if we present this to you this way, I mean, the carpenter, what has he done wrong? And all all he knows of Jesus is he's the carpenter who's claiming to be the king of the Jews. That can't be that bad. So certainly the people are going to say, no, no, let us have Jesus. You know, put Barabbas to death, release Jesus. And it seems as though that's what Pilate is hoping for in this scenario. But the religious leaders, they're trying to force him into something he wouldn't normally do. And Pilate is in a position that he thinks if he offers Jesus or Barabbas, that surely the people will choose Jesus. And Pilate would be off the hook. Again, remember the dream he had, his wife. And so now Pilate, he's figuring, I do this, and then I'll be off the hook. Everybody will be happy. He doesn't know that there's a plan, plan of the ages, right? A plan by God. We know that at one point he says to Jesus, don't you know, don't you realize I have the power to condemn you or to release you? I have power over you. Jesus says, any power you have, it's been given to you from heaven. You don't have any power. You're a puppet, Pilate. In fact, often this is called Jesus' trial before Pilate. And we called it that even as we began this study, but in another way, it's really Pilate's trial before Jesus. And he believes that if he gives them a choice, they will surely choose Jesus, but he underestimates the priests. And they're very persuasive. Barabbas is clearly popular. He was one of the zealots. In some ways, to some, would be considered more popular than Jesus because he would be one who'd want to overthrow the Romans. And isn't it ironic that we have a Roman governor who releases a guy who wants to overthrow the Romans instead of Jesus? Who, his kingdom isn't of this world. He's not going to overthrow their kingdom. He doesn't care about their kingdom. But Pilate makes the choice here too. And that's the thing that's, that's interesting about this time is that Pilate, he could have chosen not to do this at all and he could have chosen to free Jesus or to treat Jesus with kindness. Now God would have raised up somebody else in, in that role and somebody else would have been the one to condemn Jesus, but Pilate made a choice. 
And Pilate's choice was, well, I'll try to be neutral. That was what he was trying to do. But you know something? You can't be neutral. If you choose not to exalt Jesus Christ and honor him, you have chosen to dishonor him. And every one of us faces this choice in our lives. And we even face it in every situation in our life. What are we going to do with Jesus Christ? Ultimately, we face that as far as our salvation. We all know that. That is the answer to our salvation. What about Jesus? But we even face it in many other areas of our life. That old campaign years ago, what would Jesus do? Everybody was wearing those little bracelets. What would Jesus do, you know? And it's a good campaign. It was a good thing. It was a, you'd ask that question in every situation of your life. What would Jesus do? And in essence, you're making a choice to do the things that Jesus would do. Now, sometimes I'm sure people wore the little bracelet and said, what would Jesus do and did what they wanted to anyway. <laughs> The bracelet didn't give you some magic power to do what Jesus did. You know, you still had to walk in the spirit. You couldn't walk in the bracelet, right? <laughs> Look at verse 11 says, it says, but the chief priest stirred. Now that word for stirred is the word, same word we get our word earthquake from. <laughs> they caused a, a earthquake to impact the people. They stirred up the crowd so that he should rather release Barabbas to them. You know, I, I've taught this before, but I was rethinking this. Uh, you know, we often talk about the crowd on the triumphal entry and how the crowd at the triumphal entry cried out, you know, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they threw down the palm branches and they honored Jesus. And then here we are just a, a few days later. And this crowd says, no, we want Barabbas and crucify him, crucify him. And I'm sure there were some that were in the, both those crowds, but I think we have to note that this was early in the morning, which, which, which there's a reason why they would do it in the morning, because it would be before all the people were out and about. And Clearly, these chief priests stirred a crowd that they got going. It was their crowd. They formed the group. They formed the crowd in order to get Barabbas released. And it's likely most of them were a crowd of zealots who were fans of Barabbas. So they stirred them up. Make sure when they ask, you yell Barabbas. We want Barabbas. And Pilate answered and said to them, what then do you want me to do with him who's called Jesus, called King of the Jews? And again, that's the great question. What do we do with the King of the Jews? See, we can't just follow the crowd. We need to stand out in the crowd. And so they cried out again, crucify him. Now, this is not, the wording here is that it, they repeatedly said crucify him, and it's they were screaming at the top of their lungs, crucify him. I mean, these are like, you know, the anti-Trump people, like they're doing right now, you know. These are, that's, that's what it's like, this is like anarchy, you know. You can, maybe they were burning flags and lighting fires and throwing things at people. They're going crazy. Crucify him. And Pilate said to them, why? What evil has he done? But they cried all out no more. Crucify him. So Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd. This is where Pilate's at. He released Barabbas to them, and he delivered Jesus after he had scourged him to be crucified. Released a murderer and insurrectionist 
And the world has been ruled by narcissistic insurrectionists. You know, that's so much what the world is like these days. And we have anarchy in our own country right now. It's crazy, right? We got people calling for the assassination of of our president-elect. And others saying he won't make it through his first term. And, you know, it's, it's a crazy time. But Pilate, he's a people pleaser here. He's a politician, and he's even a more corrupt politician than maybe some people we know. Now, I'm not going to mention any names. <laughs> he had a fear of man. And the Bible says the fear of man is a snare. And that's where Pilate's at. He's got a fear of man and wanted to please the crowd, so he let Barabbas go. And listen, this is what Pontius Pilate is remembered for. You know, Pilate did a lot of other things. You can read the annals of history, and Pilate was an accomplished leader and politician. But the one thing that he is primarily remembered for in history is turning Jesus Christ over to be crucified, delivering him to be crucified. That single decision is his signature, if you will. The most essential decision we ever make in in life is whether to receive Jesus Christ or reject Jesus Christ. And Pilate made the decision to reject him. And this is really the division of our world. It, It really is you're either for Jesus or you're against Jesus. And you know, there may be some people who are seemingly moral and decent people and all those things, but if they're against Jesus, They're still lost. You either are a Christian or you're not. And you're not a Christian by the fact of whether you go to church or whether you've been raised in a Christian home or whether your uncle's an evangelist or something like that. It's a matter of whether you have made a personal decision and Christ has come into your life personally. And every one of us needs to Make sure we've come to grips with that. And I think most of us here, you know, we're in a midweek study. We we believe that. We've done that. If you haven't, please, may you do that tonight. Come to that place where you realize you're a sinner, you can't save yourself, and you know that the only way to be saved is through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ by the blood of Jesus Christ. And... The great thing is when you do that, he frees you. He frees you of your sin. He frees you of your guilt. And he restores your life. So he delivers Jesus to be scourged. We've talked about the scourging recently, a couple weeks ago on a Sunday morning. During that time of communion. And we're going to partake in the Lord's Supper again tonight. And Man, what an awful thing that scourging was. Just to remind you, they would take a a whip, it was called a flagellum, and it had pieces of metal and glass and things of that nature in it. It it many times had a hard, heavy ball on the end of it, and it it would cause a welt, and then they'd rip at that welt and tear the flesh. Jesus was beaten with 40 lashes. And each time they would whip the victim, they'd be looking for a confession of his faults. They'd be looking for him to talk about his crimes. And each each time they would confess one of their faults, one of their crimes, the soldier who was doing the the battering would, would let up scourging, they'd let up. 
What that tells us clearly is that Jesus Christ, our Lord, took the worst because he had no faults. He had no crimes to confess. So he took the worst of that scourging. And even under this extreme cruelty of flogging, he opened not his mouth. He did not say a word. He just took it. He took our pain. He took our stripes. Because each of us deserved more than even what he received. Worse. It says, and the soldiers, they led him away to the hall called Praetorium, and they called together the whole garrison. So the picture you have here is of these soldiers getting together. And, you know, soldiers, you know, they, they get bored with life, and these guys, they were looking to entertain themselves, and so they they call all the soldiers into the courtyard at the praetorium. This is Herod's praetorium. This is a section underneath the Antonio Fortress. There's actually an inscription at a place we go to in Israel with a, uh, a drawing of a game uh, that was known as called Kill the King. And they would play this sort of game with the soldiers. And Jesus, of course, being called the king of the Jews, they mock him. They ridicule him. And you think about the cruelty of this. You know, some men, not all men, of course, but some men are so incredibly cruel. And we live in a cruel world today. We see it. We read about it the beheading of our Christian brothers and sisters around the world, the persecution, even of others. Others, not, not even Christians, some of them are persecuted. The awful cruelty. I watched a video the other day of, of a fellow who was a pro-Trump guy being beaten up on the street, being kicked and beaten up, just the cruelty. And it, it's not just in, in, around the world, it's in our world too. I think of the cruelty of, a, of the South and the way they treated black people in the years of slavery and after slavery. The cruelty of this, the cruelty of our world. And some of them did it in the name of Christianity. Much cruelty has been performed on others in the name of Christianity. I think of Planned Parenthood and the cruelty of what they're doing. Close to a million babies being aborted every year in the United States alone. And the fall of man in sin is what brought about cruelty. And here we have the Son of God who's about to redeem the sins of men. He's about to go to the cross for the sins of men, and men are sinning against him while he's waiting to do that, while he's getting ready to do that. Men are beating him. It says they clothed him with purple, and they twisted a crown of thorns and put it on his head and began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. Well, think about these thorns. You know, the first time the word thorn is used in the Bible, it's in Genesis when the fall of man came. And God tells him, by thorns and thistles you will work, and by the sweat of your brow. And now we see thorns, the, and they're the thorns that Jesus himself created that are being placed into his skull. And at this point, there's blood dripping down his face, and and again, his back is raw. He's completely exhausted. He hasn't slept all night. He's been beaten and punched and 
spit upon, his beard has been plucked out. And they struck him on the head with a reed and spat on him and bowed the knee and they worshiped him, mocking him. And, they, and when they had mocked him, they took the purple robe off him, put his own clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. Now understand something. At any moment, Jesus could have stopped this whole thing. But he didn't because he's bound by love. His love for you and I. And one day, these fellows who beat him, along with every other single, every single other person in the world in history, one day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every single one. There's no one who will not bow the knee. Oh, they mock worshiped him then, but they will worship him. Then, verse 21, they compelled a certain man, Simon a Cyrian, the father of Alexander and Rufus, as he was coming out of the country and passing by to bear his cross. They compel this man to carry his cross. Now the way this would come about is a Roman soldier would come up to someone there on the, on the side of the street and if they wanted them to do something, they would you know, carry this cross. They would take their sword and they'd just place it on their shoulder and they'd, okay, you're, you're up. And Jesus at this point is probably falling at the bearing of his cross. He can't, he can't carry it anymore. He's, he's totally exhausted. He probably can't even walk. And so Simon comes and they and they, they tell him to do this. Now, he doesn't know Simon. And Simon doesn't know him. I mean, they, you know, there's no relationship here. There's no anything. But we do believe this man later got saved. He's mentioned again in the book of Acts and Alexander and Rufus, his sons. But he had come likely to, to, to um, celebrate the Passover. People came from all over the world to celebrate Passover. 800 miles he would have traveled. Had to come by boat to get there. There's a great old movie, by the way, on this. If you want to go to Netflix or something like that. Anthony Quinn. How many of you know who Anthony Quinn? Remember Anthony Quinn? Okay, so if you have that gray hair or you have no hair, you remember Anthony Quinn. But there's a great old movie on this. I forget the name of the movie, but it's, if you do Anthony Quinn and you know, bearing the cross, it'll, it'll, you find it, search it. Worth, worth a watch on what you see and the, and, and the way he changes and the things that happen in his life. And they brought him to the place, Golgotha, which is translated place of the skull. And they gave him wine mingled with myrrh but he did not take it. Now, the name Place of the Skull, think of that, Golgotha. I mean, it's even, it's even a name that grieves your heart. And of course, it's where we get our name Calvary from. Golgotha. And they give him this drink. It's sort of a, considered like a narcotic drink of that day. And it was offered to all those who were suffering uh, to take away a bit of their suffering. But Jesus declines it because he doesn't want to allow anything to come between him and the suffering he needs to go through. Also, you know, I was thinking that looking down in the ages, he sees that many will suffer for him. Many will suffer the martyrs throughout the ages and they weren't given any narcotic. So he, he takes it all. And when they crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots for them to determine what every man should take. Now it's interesting because 
it just goes on to say in verse 25, now it was the third hour and they crucified him and the inscription and the accusation was written, the king of the Jews. You know, the gospel writers don't give us a lot of detail about the crucifixion. Maybe it was too hard for anyone to really write it down. There have been those who have studied crucifixion and the medical, the things that take place in the human body while a person is going through crucifixion. And it's a brutal thing. Again, you can Google this and read it. I've given the description in the past. I'm not going to go through it all tonight. But <clears throat> during, that, during that atrocious thing you're going through, that pain, the pain is, again, we get our word excruciating from the word crucifixion. It means out of the cross, excruciating. And when a person died of crucifixion, they would either die of a heart rupture or they would suffocate. And the pain would be throughout your entire body, all your joints. You weren't getting enough oxygen into your body, so you, all your, your joints, your muscles, everything would be screaming, screaming with pain. And yet we know that even the physical pain wasn't the worst of what Jesus went through. And they put on his placard, if you will, above the cross, something written there, whether it was on some sort of piece of wood or whatever it may be, the king of the Jews. That was considered his crime. They put that on every cross. The crime was listed or crimes. And his was that he was the king of the Jews. In this whole scene, God is completely in charge. You might remember that Matthew tells us that the other that the Jews come to Pilate and they say, don't say he's the king of the Jews. Say that he said he was the king of the Jews. Put that on there. And Pilate says, what I've written, I've written. We're not changing it. And they crucified two robbers, one on his right and the other on his left. So the scripture was fulfilled and he was numbered with the transgressors. Again, Isaiah 53 being fulfilled. We know, by the way, one of these robbers, one of these thieves is converted on the cross. But initially, they're both reviling him. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who destroy this temple and build it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. Now, Jesus didn't say he was going to destroy the temple and build it in three days. He was speaking of the temple of his, of his body. And they, of course, accused him that he was going to destroy the literal temple. But if he had come down from the cross, he wouldn't have saved you and I. And likewise, the chief priests also, mocking among themselves with scribes, said, he saved others, himself he cannot save. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe even those who were crucified with him reviled him. So they're, they're mocking him now. They're, they're not believing he really is the Christ, the King of the Jews. They're, they're saying that in derision. And if he had saved himself, he would not have saved us. And they've had plenty of time to believe in him, but now they're just, they've, they've just come to the point where they're just mocking. They say, oh, if you come down from the cross, we'll believe now. Well, they wouldn't have believed. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And this was a supernatural darkness that came upon the land. And during these three hours of darkness is when Jesus Christ bore our sins. The wrath of God is being poured out upon his own son. That wrath that you and I deserve is being poured out on him as he's on the cross. All the judgment of every human being. Everything that every one of us deserved. Makes you think of what Paul would write. He made him who knew no sin to become sin that we might become the righteousness of God in him. 
And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lamach sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I think of the separation that Jesus is having from his Father, and it just blows my mind when I think of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and now God the Father and God the Son, there's a separation for the first time ever. And in some ways, it seems as though that was more painful than anything else Jesus was going through. Some of those who stood by, when they heard that, said, look, he is calling for Elijah. Then someone ran and filled a sponge full of sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink, saying, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come and take him down. See the cruelty in this? Come on, it's like a show. I want to see what happens. Let's see if Elijah will come down. We're going to see some miracles. We're going to see some exciting stuff here. Let's watch what happens. Isn't it strange how people, how the human frame is attracted to this sadistic sort of evil stuff? Like a sideshow. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. Of his own volition, no one took his life from him. He gave his life. And the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now this is very graphic when you think about this because this veil was an incredible veil. Here, here's, here's the scene we have. You have the temple site. And on the temple site, there's the court of women, there's a court of men, and there's a court of the Gentiles. And then you have, within the intersection of the temple area, what's called the holy place. And within the holy place is all the various pieces of furniture that were used for the practice of the priest and the the sacrifices and such, the altar of incense, the, the, uh, the, the brass laver, the golden altar where they would do the sacrifices. And, and then within that was another closed-in area, which is known as the Holy of Holies. And that area would be the place where the priest would go in and sprinkle the blood on the altar and he would only go in once a year. The high priest, one time per year, was allowed to go in there. And it was, it was a dangerous place for the high priest. Because if he had any sin in his life when he went before there, the first sacrifice he actually had to perform was a sacrifice for himself. And if he had any sin when he went in there, tradition tells us they would tie a rope around the leg of that priest. And that... If he fell, in case he fell over dead so that they could pull him out of there. And so this is the place. This is the holy of holies. And only the priest once a year. So not very many men throughout history have even gone into this place. The people have never seen this place. The Sanhedrin has never seen this place. The only ones who would have seen it would have been the high priest and the Levites who made it. And once they closed it up, only that high priest was allowed in there. And now what we see, that when Jesus Christ breathes his last, from top to bottom, now the, the, the veil, most scholars estimate it to be 60 feet high. The, hard to know the measurements exactly because they use cubits and and uh, they don't, we don't know exactly the measurement of a cubit. We think it's about 18 inches. And so, about 60 feet high. But the veil would be anywhere from 12 to 18 inches thick. So it's a very heavy veil. And it says that the veil was rent from top to bottom. So who tore the veil? No man tore that veil. Now, we know that there was an earthquake during this time also. 
And as the veil was rent in two from top to bottom, it would have exposed that holy of holies, that place, for the very first time. You know what that speaks to us about? Access. The book of Hebrews tells us we have access to the throne of God. We can come boldly before the throne of God because of the blood of the Lamb, because of the finished work of the cross, because of our great high priest who delivered that access. What a wonderful thing. No longer do we come by the blood of goats and rams and lambs, and no longer just once a year. You and I have access to the throne every day. In fact, more than that, we have it every single moment of every day. It's amazing. We have access. And not only that, but the same Holy God, Holy Spirit, who dwelt within that that place of the holy place of the temple of God. Well, we are now called the temple of the Holy Spirit. So the holy place has actually come into us. We have the holiness of God within us. It's amazing. Meditate on that for a while tonight as you take communion, as you consider the access we have. So, verse 29, when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, said, truly this man was the son of God. Isn't it interesting how Jesus Christ touches the hearts of of all kinds of people, all walks of life, all nationalities, all backgrounds. And here is this Roman centurion, certainly a man of power, a man of pride, and he'd watched many, many men die. And he sees Jesus Christ on that cross, and he says, truly, this man was the son of God. And there were also women looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, the less, and Joseph, and Salome, who also followed him and ministered to him when he was in Galilee, and many other women who came up from with him to Jerusalem. Question, where are the guys? (laughs) Where are the men? Well, we know that they claim that they would never deny the Lord. Remember, Peter, he was the leader of it. He said, no, no, Lord, even if I have to die with you, I won't deny you. And they all said so also. They all agreed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, Lord, you're, 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 we're, not gonna, we're not gonna deny you. We're gonna follow you. We're, gonna, we're going to, we're faithful, Lord. We're gonna fight for you. And they've all run away and hid. The only of the apostles that we know was at the cross was John. But these women are so faithful. And sometimes, you know, we put women in this lower place in the church and we, we, you know, sort of treat them that way. Let me tell you, Jesus Christ did more to elevate the role of women than anybody else in history. He elevated, he elevated women to an equal status in the body of Christ And the women were the ones who were at the cross. The women were the ones who were more faithful. And then the women were the ones who also we're going to see were at the set of the resurrection. Jesus first appeared to Mary Magdalene and the other women. They traveled with Jesus. And you know, it seems to me very clearly they understood more than any of the men what was really going on. And you know what, you ladies, I think you understand more now too sometimes. We men are kind of dumb like bricks. Well, I'll I'll speak for me and the rest of you guys in this room. (laughs) Okay, I'm getting a phone call, excuse me. (laughs) It's one thing when cell phones go on out there, but this is mine. 
And when the evening had come, because it was the preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. What, an, what a great risk this man is taking. He's a member of the Sanhedrin, and he, and we know again, according to the other gospels, Nicodemus, who had come to Jesus at that time at night and asked Jesus some questions. No doubt they had been converted, and they take the body of Jesus and make sure he gets a proper burial. Now, it doesn't seem that these two fellows spoke up in the mock trial. They probably were there. Maybe they were a bit ashamed that they didn't speak up. And it had only been six hours and many times a body stayed on the cross for days, but they wanted Jesus to get off the cross. They knew it was Passover time. They didn't want to leave him on the cross. And Pilate, we know, he marveled. He found out, they, it says, when they found out from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Pilate here had marveled that he was already dead. He was amazed. You might remember that they had gone to Jesus and were about to break his legs. They broke the legs of the other men there and they didn't break Jesus' legs because he was already dead. He died in six hours and that was fairly quick for cru crucifixion. In fact, one man, according to history, the longest ever on a cross was 13 days. And uh, Jesus, he took it all at once. And so when he found out from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph and he brought fine linen and took him, took him down and wrapped him in the linen and he laid him in a tomb which he had hewn with the rock and rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Joseph took special care of the body of Jesus. Gave him his own tomb and a, a hewn tomb out of rock is a, you know, this is a very wealthy man to be able to do this. It would have taken a long time to cut into this rock. This isn't like a cave that was naturally there. We're talking about a stone that they cut into, and they didn't have power tools. And it was a very special thing to a family to have this. And, and I've been to this, the tomb in Jerusalem where they, it could have been a grave of Jesus. We don't know if it is the actual grave. But it's large enough to hold several bodies, and that's what they would do. They would, they would have this tomb to be able to hold all their family members. And so Joseph, he takes this step of faith, and you can be sure that by doing that, he was losing his position by being a disciple of Jesus Christ, he's now going to be cast out of the synagogue, lose his position in the Sanhedrin. And you know what? It just shows once again that walking with Jesus costs us something. Sometimes it costs us relationships, family relationships. But it's worth it. And so, verse 47 in Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, observed where he was laid. He's placed within the tomb, and these two women observe where his body is laying so they could come to the tomb three days later. And when they do, they get a great surprise. And so next time, we will come to the resurrection and study that together. At this time, we're going to partake in the Lord's Supper together. Uh, Mike can come and lead us in some worship. We thank you, Lord, for your word tonight. We thank you for the incredible thing you did for us on this cross, and we are so grateful for your grace toward us. We're so grateful for the finished work of the cross. And as we come to the table tonight, Lord, we 
apply the work of the cross, the blood of Jesus Christ to our life, and we once again come and are so grateful. We remember what you've done for us. We proclaim your death. And we're so filled with your love because of you, Lord. And again tonight, if you have never come to Christ, if you've never been uh, where you've asked Christ to forgive your sins and come into your life, you know, it's not really about, a, again, any religious thing, but it's, it's, a, it's a relationship and it's a step of faith and it starts with you acknowledging your sin and opening your heart to the forgiveness that he can give you. And I'm gonna pray a simple prayer right now. If you wanna come to that place and you wanna receive Christ, you pray this prayer with me. And he'll come in. He will, he's faithful. He will come in and change your life. You don't have to do anything except acknowledge your sin and open your heart and be willing to change. Repent. And he'll change you. He does the work if we let him. So if you want Christ as your Lord and Savior, you pray with this with me right now. You say to Lord Jesus, say, Lord, I, I believe in you. And I open my heart to you tonight. I confess my sin and I tell you, Lord, that I know you're the only way my sin can be forgiven. I believe that you died on the cross and rose from the dead. And I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And I open my heart to receive you into my life and ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit and make me the person you want me to be. Change my life, take my life, fill my life. If you prayed that prayer tonight for the very first time, we'd like to know who you are to help you walk with Jesus. So I'm just gonna ask you to raise up your hand right now if that's, this is the first time you've ever prayed this prayer, you've asked Jesus to come into your life. so we can give you a Bible, we can pray for you, we can help you walk in, in, in your new walk with the Lord. Don't worry about anybody else in the room. If you prayed the prayer, it's just between you and God, just go ahead and slip your hand up right now and just say, yes, that's me. I did it. I want Jesus. I want to know I'm going to heaven. I want to know my sins are forgiven. Anybody at all tonight? Just say yes to that. Lord knows all our hearts, knows everything about us. If you have a relationship with Jesus, you know, communion is a wonderful thing to partake in. Now, the way we're gonna do this tonight is different than we do it on Sunday. You come and get the elements on your own, you take them, and you, you just take them on your own. You know, you and your spouse, or by yourself, or with a friend if you want to, but you just take it. Pray and ask the Lord to speak to your heart as you partake in communion. And we'll worship as we do that. May the Lord bless you tonight. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the Jesus, to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain, to break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Sacrifice so freely give. 
such a price, but I'll redemption heaven's gates is swing wide. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. To break every chain, break every chain. Break every chain to break every chain and break every chain, break every chain. Let's all stand and sing. Jesus, Lord of heaven, I do not deserve the grace that you have given and the promise of your word. Lord, I stand in wonder of the sacrifice you made 
Lord, have mercy me on measure. My debt you freely pay. Your love is deeper than any ocean higher than the heavens reaches beyond the stars in the sky. Jesus, your love has no bounds. Jesus, your love has no bounds. Jesus, Lord of heaven, I do not deserve the grace that you have given. And the promise of your word, Lord, I stand in wonder of the sacrifice you made. With mercy beyond measure, my debt you freely paid. thank you for that love so amazing that love that's so unconditional Lord the love that took our place on the cross that paid our price we thank you God Lord we give our hearts to you tonight and ask for you to mold us to shape us Lord to be transformed into your image Lead us now, Father. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys.